Welcome to Chapter 20 of Vamsco U.S. History, Becoming a World Power from 1865 to 1917. Please make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and like, comment, and share this video with your friends. Thanks! First up is William Seward. So William Seward was a leading Republican even before the Civil War, and he served as Secretary of State for Abraham Lincoln. He was one of the most influential Secretary of States in history because he did a lot for U.S. foreign policy. Among this, during the Civil War, he helped to prevent Great Britain and France from entering the war on the side of the Confederacy against the North. He also led the drive to annex Midway Island, which is an island in the Pacific, and he also gained rights to build a canal in Nicaragua. But probably his most famous purchase was the purchase of the vast territory of Alaska, which he purchased from Russia. And although he was a powerful advocate for expansion of the United States, he didn't always get what he wanted. So Congress didn't allow him to annex Hawaii and purchase the Danish West Indies. To aid in expansion, a former U.S. Navy captain called Alfred Thayer Mahon wrote an important book, and it was called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, and he wrote it in 1890. It basically argued that a strong navy was crucial to a country's ambitions of securing foreign markets and becoming a world power, which the United States was trying to do at this time. And it was widely read among American citizens, but also some people in Europe and Japan read it as well. As a result, U.S. naval strategists persuaded Congress to finance the construction of modern steel ships and encouraged the acquisition of overseas islands such as Samoa. And they also wanted coaling and supply stations so the new fleet could be powerful and it could project itself across all the seas in the world. And by 1900, they were successful enough to have the third largest navy in the world. Elsewhere in the world, such as places in China, foreigners such as the Japanese started to come into the country and started to control places. And so as a result, by the end of the 19th century, nationalism and xenophobia, which is the hatred and fear of foreigners, was on the rise in China. And in 1900, a secret society of Chinese nationalists, they called themselves the Society of Harmonious Fists, or the Boxers, attacked foreign settlements and murdered dozens of Christian missionaries who were from these foreign nations. And in order to protect American lives and property, U.S. troops participated in an international force and they marched into Beijing, the capital of China at the time, and crushed this rebellion, the Boxers. And they also forced China to pay a huge sum of indemnities, which weakened the imperial regime at the time, which was the Qing Empire. Also at this time, there was a lot of yellow press, also known as yellow journalism. So this is basically the modern day equivalent of fake news. And basically, it actively promoted war fever in the United States at the time, with sensationalistic reporting that featured both bold and lurid headlines of crime, disaster, and scandal. And the publishers hoped to do this because they wanted America to go into the war, defeat the enemy, and gain so many new lands. So some publishers who did this were New York newspapers such as Pulitzer and Hearst, and they printed these exaggerated and false accounts of Spanish atrocities in Cuba. And later, this would also contribute to a big push for Spanish-American war. Most of the time, however, the presses were printing fake news, and as a result, it caused a lot of unnecessary conflict in America during this time period. The Spanish-American War was a short war fought only for a couple months from April until August of 1898. There were many causes. For example, America really wanted to imperialize like many European countries at the time, and the Caribbean just happened to be close and owned by Spain. Also, public opinion and yellow journalism was really for imperialism at the time. Also at this time, Cubans were re revolting against the Spanish plantation owners since it was still a colony at this time. Other factors included a letter from the Spanish minister who was critical of President McKinley and the U.S. public didn't like it, and the sinking of the battleship Maine in Havana, Cuba. The yellow press accused the Spanish of blowing up the ship, but in reality, it was probably just an accident. After the war started, the first shots were fired in the Philippines, and the new strong American Navy was able to defeat the Spanish ships. Capturing the land of the Philippines came later. In Cuba, volunteer forces invaded, but many of them died from tropical diseases such as malaria, typhoid, and dysentery, more than the Spanish bullets caused deaths. Also in Cuba was the famous cavalry charge up San Juan Hill in Cuba left by the Rough Riders, who were a regiment of volunteers led by Theodore Roosevelt, who would later become a president. And this was really triumphant for the United States because they sort of defeated the poorly led Spanish army at this point. Soon later, the U.S. Navy destroyed the Spanish fleet in Cuba as well. And without a navy, Spain realized it needed to ask the U.S. for peace. <laughs> 
Backtracking a bit, the war was started by the Teller Amendment, which was in response to the President's war message, President McKinley's. So Congress passed a joint resolution on April 20th of 1898 authorizing war. And part of the resolution, the Teller Amendment, declared that the United States had no intention of taking political control of Cuba, and that once peace was restored on the island, the Cuban people would control their own government. After the war had ended, the Platt Amendment of 1901 basically held that the Teller Amendment would stay true and it guaranteed U.S. respect for Cuban sovereignty. But U.S. troops still remain in the island, and later Congress withdrew all the troops under C Cuba's acceptance of terms in this new amendment called the Platt Amendment of 1901. And Cuban nationalists didn't really like it, but it basically required Cuba to agree to, one, never sign a treaty with a foreign power that impaired its independence, so no one else, also to, two, to permit the United States to intervene in Cuban affairs and to preserve its independence and maintain law and order, and even today, America has a large stance in Cuba, and three, to allow the U.S. to maintain naval bases in Cuba, including the permanent famous Guantanamo Bay, which has been the subject to debate for... A long time. And in effect, the Platt Amendment made Cuba a U.S. protectorate, so the U.S. would protect it, but it wouldn't totally rule over it. And for many years, it would be subject to U.S. oversight and control. Here is Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. As a result of the Spanish-American War, America gained a bunch of old Spanish territories and colonies, such as the Philippines and Cuba. But there was this problem about the Philippine question, because people in America, the imperialists and the anti-imperialists, were divided. Imperialists favored annexing the Philippines as part of the United States, while anti-imperialists opposed it and wanted Philippines to become their own independent nation. This created a lot of problems. And eventually, the United States basically agreed with the imperialists and favored annexing the Philippines. Well, this really angered the people of the Philippines who were outraged. They wanted independence from Spain, but now the United States controlled them and they still weren't being offered their independence. And so Filipino nationalist leader Emilio Aguinaldo led an insurrection to try to take over nationalism and independence for the Philippines. And even though he had fought alongside U.S. troops in the Spanish-American War, he now led bands of guerrilla fighters against U.S. control. And finally, after three years, the U.S. troops were able to put down the insurrection, but it proved that the Philippines really still wanted independence. Another branch of U.S. foreign policy during this time was the open-door policy. So at this time, China's imperial government was weakening drastically, and spheres of influence, such as Russia, Japan, Great Britain, France, and Germany, had all started to sort of creep into China and control China little by little. Well, the United States didn't want to lose the lucrative China trade, and so they dispatched a diplomatic note to these nations of spheres of influence and asked them to accept the concept of an open door, basically which all nations would have equal trading privileges in China. But not everyone agreed or rejected this concept, so the Americans just decided to accept this open door policy, and this was viewed as a dem diplomatic triumph for America. A big battle at this time was between imperialists and anti-imperialists. So imperialists basically wanted to take foreign territories, all for the United States, and turn the United States into sort of like a European superpower. While the anti-imperialists wanted to sort of back off to give other nations independence, just like America had gained independence themselves. And they primarily went against imperialists. This happened in a lot of places such as Cuba and the Philippines where this debate was raging over how much control the United States should have of these new territories. Different presidents during this time had different views on foreign policy. So after McKinley was assassinated, his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, who had also served in the Spanish-American War, came into power. And his foreign policy could best be described as big stick diplomacy. Basically, his motto was to speak softly and carry a big stick. And it was this aggressive foreign policy. And he wanted to act boldly and decisively in situations to attempt to build the reputation of the United States as a world power like Europe, which they were not like before. Before. And imperialists really liked this because the U.S. was expanding rapidly under Roosevelt, but critics didn't like breaking the tradition of non-involvement in global politics, such as what Washington said when he was president. Also following him was William Howard Taft, big man, and he basically carried 
did not carry a big stick. He basically adopted a foreign policy that was mildly expansionist but depended more on investors' dollars than on the Navy's battleships. So he promoted dollar diplomacy, which basically used U.S. trade to support American enterprises in other countries in South America, and he hoped that by showing investment in foreign countries, he could gain the favor of these Latin American countries. After him was Woodrow Wilson, and Wilson was this advocate of moral or missionary diplomacy. This was basically diplomacy which really opposed imperialism and the big stick and dollar diplomacy right before them. And this basically wanted to respect other nations' rights and support the spread of democracy. And this really hoped to correct the perceived wrongs and self-interest of the imperialists right before Wilson took office. To fulfill Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy promise, Roosevelt instituted the Roosevelt Corollary, which was in addition to the Monroe Doctrine, which you may remember the Monroe Doctrine was basically issued in the early 1800s stating that Europeans should not meddle in these new world affairs. And this basically applied to all of the Latin American nations that were in deep financial trouble and couldn't pay debts to European creditors. So many Latin American countries were in debt at this time. And as a result, he declared that the United States would intervene instead whenever necessary to sort of keep the peace in the region. And so the United States would send gunboats to Latin American countries that was delinquent in paying its debts, and U.S. sailors and Marines would then occupy the country's major ports to manage the collection of customs taxes for the Europeans. So this sort of provided the peace in the Western Hemisphere without a European and Latin American war, which was deemed as not good at this time. So over the next 20 years, presidents basically used this in many places around Latin America, and one long-term result of such intervention was porous relations within the entire region of Latin America. So even today, many Latin American countries sort of resent the United States. During the Wilson administration, Mexico was experiencing times of revolution and civil war, so our neighbors from the south were kind of in turmoil at this time. Eventually, a Democratic president came into power, but immediately he was challenged by a band of rebels loyal to Pancho Villa, shown here in blue. And Pancho Villa basically hoped to destabilize his opponent's government, and he led raids across the U.S.-Mexican border and even murdered several people in Texas and New Mexico. Well, President Wilson didn't like this and ordered a general, John J. Pershing, in a quote-unquote expeditionary force to pursue Villa into northern Mexico. They weren't able to capture him, and the president of Mexico was kind of annoyed at the American presence in Mexico, and as a result, the U.S. had to start pulling out. Also at this time, World War I was just basically heating up, and the United States was about to enter, so that was also another reason for the U.S. starting to pull out of Mexico. That was basically the Mexican intervention, sort of the military intervention under Wilson that wasn't really common at the time. So this has been Chapter 20 of AMSCO U.S. History, Becoming a World Power. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one when we continue the story of America.